please open your Bibles to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2. We're going to focus our attention tonight on verses 11 and 12. 1 Peter 2. Follow as I read verse 11. Peter says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among Gentiles so that in a thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may because of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation. It was one of the most pivotal pivotal moments in all of history and certainly the most pivotal Christmas day in all of American history. During the War of Independence, the British used many different kinds of mercenaries, just hired soldiers to fight for them. Since they couldn't send all of the soldiers across the sea, they would hire different people from different countries and would take the boat across the pond, join up with the British forces. Probably the most represented group were the Hessians. And the most stalwart leader of the Hessians was Johann Rahl. Rahl hated Americans. He detested the British rebels who were calling themselves Americans. He was a professional soldier, trained to the highest degree. They were just simple farmers, craftsmen, with no training. He developed a reputation over the years as a ruthless commander who just disrespected and desecrated the reputation of Americans at every possible turn. He thought they were weak cowards who could not possibly stand against him and his highly trained Hessian forces. He was in command of the British city of Trenton on Christmas of 1776. A little background. On Christmas Eve, the junior officers began informing him that there was a a looming attack from the Americans on Trenton, that they wanted to capture that city. The Americans had been beaten back very badly. The war was literally in the balance. It was the the dead of winter. The American forces were literally freezing to death. They tried one last time to secure a victory at Trenton. It was a fortified outpost of the British Empire, very unlikely to be attacked. When he heard about these plans, Rawl laughed. He refused to add more guns. He said bayonets would be enough for these simple men after receiving this intelligence. He then threw a drunken party, played cards all night, and slept in on Christmas Day. It was very bitterly cold on that Christmas Eve night, so much so that floating down the Delaware River were pieces of ice that the Americans who were crossing the river thought would actually hit their boats and sink them. He was so distracted by his drinking, he never read a letter given to him by an officer who was a spy for the Americans that said, they're going to attack tomorrow. Furthermore, the second in command had given the troops off on Christmas morning because it was Christmas and it was very cold, so they were inside warming their hands and their feet. You know the story. You've seen the painting of Washington crossing the Delaware. The Americans totally surprised Rawl and his forces. Rawl ordered a counterattack, mounted his horse, and as soon as he was, he was shot. And as he laid in the street, bleeding to death... George Washington stood over him and had him sign a surrender. He only lived long enough to make that signature and then died. All military experts agree on this one fundamental truth. That the greatest danger of warfare is always underestimating your enemy. Rawl had done that and because of that, Literally, a nation was born and the British lost the American colonies. Underestimating an enemy. You know, Peter understood this. Peter understood this very clearly. He understood this very well. 
He wants to inform us tonight of something very simple. It's what I want to be a foundation for the rest of the conference. Spiritual life is warfare. Whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, you walked into this room in the middle of a massive war for your soul. Whether you realize it or not, you are in a war. Captive by the enemy and unable to fight or on God's side and unwilling to fight or engage deeply in the fight. I hope you're fighting. I hope that's why you're here. I hope that some, something in your soul said, I need to go to that weekend conference just to get rejuvenated in how I'm going to fight this war against my flesh, this war against all the forces of hell, this war to sanctify my life and present it wholly to God. I hope that's why you're here. Unfortunately, I have the fear that many of you came because it's fun, and it is. You like the music, and it's good. You want to enjoy their friends, and they're special. But you're in a war whether you believe it or not, whether you realize it or not, whether you know it or not, and Peter certainly understood that. Here's the catch, though. The enemy is you. Peter says there are fleshly lusts that reside inside you that are waging a war against you. You are your own worst enemy, he says. Well, okay, if that's true, then how in the world can I fight against myself? How can I fight lusts that are within me? How can I identify them? How can I be aware of my heart? How can I see my sin, which everything about me chooses to try to hide and cling to in some sort of secretive manner? This conference is about sin this weekend. It's to make you more aware of your sin. Because the more you are aware of your sin, the more you will be aware of the grace of that is at the crucifixion, pinnacle of history, where Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, was sacrificed willingly as a substitute for the wrath that sinners deserve. Sin is uh, very easily misunderstood. Well, I mean, what is the definition? I, I would love to take the time and have every one of you write down a definition of sin. What do you think sin is? How do you define it? Well, it's defined biblically as anything done spoken, thought, or imagined that is not in, get this, perfect conformity to the Word of God. So sin is not being perfect. Anything less than perfection is sin. Now there are several categories of sin. There's sins of commission, doing something wrong that's clearly stated as wrong. Sins of omission, not doing something right that's stated in the Bible that we ought to do. There are sins that you do willingly and you know you're sinning. And Leviticus has a whole provision for covering sins and confessing sins of which you're ignorant. You have no idea you sin. But you're still culpable. Now, let me be as clear as I can. Sin, your disposition to do evil, your desire to do that which is not right, that which is against God's word, sin is not the result of a bad childhood. Sin is not insufficient training. It's not some traumatic event that happened early in your life. It's not the result of the influence of others. It's not the social pressure. It's not the media pressure. It's not bad examples. Sin doesn't even come from the devil. Please note this, if Satan himself and all of his demons were thrown into hell today, that wouldn't impact your ability to conquer sin one iota. The problem, the problem is you, the problem is me. I was in a parenting class with my wife just uh, last year and uh, my friend Chris said something that's had a lasting impact on us. You know, as parents, you, you, you try to raise your kids. We have three boys, Luke, John, Mark. We skipped Matthew, and the next one will be Acts. So, <laughs> and they're not in order. We, I know the order, but Luke, John, Mark. I have three boys. I'm trying to raise them in the discipline and nurture the Lord. I'm doing the very best I can. But there's this I impulse as a parent to try to protect them, to try, to try to keep them pure, try to keep them holy, try to keep them out of trouble, try to keep them influenced from the world. And I feel that as a parent, I don't want my kids exposed, my three sons, exposed to something that's going to mess with their heart. Until that day in parenting class that my friend Chris said, you can't do 
anything to mess your kids up. They come that way. <laughs> and he's right. You know, of all the lessons I had to teach my little sons, and, and I tried many of them, do this, do this, you know, just throw the ball. I never had to say, okay, today, guys, come here. Today, today is how to do wrong. Watch this. I'm going to put the keys on the counter on the table, and, and I'm going to say don't touch them, then I want you to touch them. Ready? Ready, go. And they touch them. Good, that's sin. <laughs> your parents never had to teach you how to sin. You were pretty good at it from your birth. All of us come messed up. The goal of parenting is not to keep them pure. The goal of parenting is to show them the evil of their heart and to show them a savior. That's the goal of God in parenting you as well. Well, I want us to look just briefly as an overview, kind of get some altitude in these two verses. And if you want a little outline, I want to show you three rationales, three rationales for fighting against fleshly lusts. Why in the world should I fight against my desires? Why should I fight against my lusts? Why should I fight against sinful impulses? Well, Peter gives us three rationales in these two verses. And the reason is what we do with God, what we do with ourselves, and what we do with sin. All of us tend to humanize God, glorify ourselves, and thus minimize sin. Once we humanize God, oh, he's just like us. He he wouldn't really be mad at this. He's, He's forgiving. What a kind God. We humanize God. Psalm 50 says, the sin of Israel was they thought God was just like them. In trying to humanize God, we always deify ourselves. We're more like God than we really think. We're not as bad as anyone would tell us. I mean, come on, people are basically good. And because we humanize God, because we glorify ourselves, we always minimize sin. I want to ask you at the beginning of this weekend, are you in any dimension minimizing the sin in your life? I'm confident of this. If you are spiritually sensitive, if you have a sensitivity to the Lord, I have every confidence that if, if given just a few seconds, and I were to ask you, what are the sins you're wrestling with? What is that besetting sin that Hebrews talks about? that you're struggling with, that you've repented of, that you've come to communion, the Lord's table over and over and over and repented and repented and confessed and confessed and it's still a struggle. Those are the ones we want to talk about this weekend. Maybe not in specific, maybe not in particular, but to give you the tools necessary to begin the fight and not to underestimate the enemy, which you'll find right inside your very heart. The first rationale for fighting against fleshly lust is right here in verse 11. It's very simple. Christian citizenship demands the fight. Christian citizenship demands the fight. Let me say it another way. If you're a Christian, you have to fight. If you're a Christian, you're called to fight. If you're a Christian, God wants you to fight against the fleshly lust that reside in you. He says, beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. Now, Peter, like Paul urges his readers to make critical, ethical, and spiritual decisions, spiritual changes in their lives because they've perceived right theology about God and about themselves. Listen, good theology doesn't just land in your, in your mind. There, there's, a, there's a very easy temptation, especially at a conference like this, is to tell yourself, because I've heard and because I've understood, then I've got it. Listen, I have... I have enough notes to sink battleships at home on sermons. Just because you hear it, just because you understand it, and just because you can write things down about it doesn't mean it's sunk into your soul. Do spiritual realities, does theology make a difference in how you think, how you decide, what you do, what you don't do, what you watch, what you don't watch? We say what you don't say, how you say what you say. Not because it's good, not because it's moral, but does spiritual truth trigger a response to God, a reflex to God to act appropriately to the world because of the fight that you're waging and winning within? Romans 12, 1, you know it. I urge you, 
Brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Let me ask you a question in regard to being a, an alien on this planet. You say, well, I, I, I've seen some of the shows on TV. I don't think I'm an alien on this planet. No, Peter's very clear. I urge you as aliens and strangers. And what he's saying is, I, I'm urging you as a foreigner. You're a foreigner on this planet. Why? Because your citizenship resides in heaven. You're just sojourning. You're just traveling through this world. Here's the question then. Jesus said in Matthew 16, What will a man profit if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? You've probably heard those verses before. You've probably not understood what's going on in the context, in the language. What will a man give in exchange for a soul? What would he do to forfeit his soul? That's the language of warfare. What would a man surrender? What would a man give up and not keep his soul? Martin Luther. Martin Luther, wow. Wow. This is a man who understood how to wrestle with his own flesh. In fact, he tried to do it in the power of his own strength for many years and almost drove him insane until he found the grace of God. But even after that, he understood the fight as a citizen of another world with the fleshly lusts that are attached from his heart like an umbilical cord to the world that he constantly had to sever. This is what he said. Conduct yourselves as those who are no longer citizens of the world. For your possessions lie not on this earth, but in heaven. And although you may have lost all temporal goods, you still have Christ, who is more than all else. The devil is the prince of this world, and he rules it. His citizens are the people of the world. Therefore, since you are not of the world, act as a stranger in an inn who does not have his possessions with him, but merely procures food and spends his money for it. For this world is merely a place of transit. Wow. For this world is merely a place of transit where we cannot stay. We must travel farther. Therefore, we should use worldly goods only to shelter and sustain ourselves before we depart and go to another land. In heaven, we are citizens. On earth, we are pilgrims and guests. Hey, if you know Jesus Christ, listen, this is not your home. You've heard it. Do you really believe it? We sang it earlier. We sang about that great day when we'll go and see Christ and finally be home. Where's your citizenship lie? I was just in uh, New Zealand last week. And uh, it was, uh, by the way, of of all the places to argue for global warming, I've never been colder in my life. Um, Someone just who's arguing that just needs to go outside. Just just go outside without your jacket and you'll understand that uh, you shouldn't be so loud down in New Zealand for global warming. Came home, my son said, Dad, did your head hurt? And I said, why? He said, well, you were, you, were, you were upside down for like a week on the bottom of the world. I said, no, I'm doing okay. <laughs> when I was in New Zealand, and I love New Zealand. I've, I've been there a dozen or 15 times. I love it. People there, the, the, the richness of the fellowship with the Christians there is, is really unmatched. They love Christ. They sing of Christ. They sing the same songs. It's just wonderful. But it was very obvious when I was down there that I didn't belong there. Especially on the road. I, um, uh, I had a car for a day. I shouldn't have had a car for the day. Um, they drive on the wrong side, not the left side, the wrong side of the road. Um, and the whole idea of a roundabout is, is it's a beautiful thing. It is everyone comes to the roundabout, and you can kind of keep everybody moving. No one has to stop. No light. You keep coming. Well, I come to the roundabout. Everything freaks out, and I just stopped. And everybody's blowing their horns from every direction. 
And I just thought, I don't even know which way to go. And if I do, am I going to get hit? And what, am I, what's, what are they going to tell my wife? He got killed in a roundabout. We're sorry. <laughs> that wasn't nearly as as odd as, as being in Australia, and I knew I was in another world because I, I, I got up early because of jet lag uh, a few years ago and went out running. Um, I knew I, you know, I was just going to go take a run. I have this little trick. I'll, I'll run for 20 minutes. I'll see if I can make it back in 19 minutes. You know, it's kind of a race against myself. So I went about 20 minutes, turned around, started running back, and everything looked the same. Everything. Every house, every street, and I kept running. 25 minutes. 30 minutes. I was out there for two hours. <laughs> Supposed to speak at 9 o'clock. Finally, about 9.30, this, this Australian police officer pulls up to me. He says, hey, mate, is your name Rick? Said, yeah. He said, they'll be looking for you, man. I said, yeah, I'm looking for them too. I had no idea how to find my way back. You know, uh, as silly as that is, we ought to be that uncomfortable in this world. We just don't feel at home. It just doesn't feel right. Not comfortable with the lust, comfortable with the comforts. Are you a citizen of heaven? Let me just ask you at the very beginning of the conference. We're not going to wait till the last night and sing Kumbaya. Let me ask you right now the first night. Are you a Christian? Are you a believer? Do you understand the gospel? Do you understand, listen, do you understand how bad in trouble you are with God? Do you understand that that sin, that very sin that we're called to fight, that sin that dwells within you, that desire to do wrong, that's enough to damn you in a hell forever with no second chance? It's real simple. Matthew tells us in the Sermon on the Mount through the the words of Jesus that Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you can't go to heaven. Basically saying, unless you're perfect, you can't go to heaven. Now, we can wait a long time to see who will raise their hand to see if they're perfect. No one's hand will ever raise. We need perfection, which we can never have. Jesus Christ is perfect. He lived in every way, honoring God, obeying God, perfect in every sense. And the righteousness of God in Christ is given to us by faith. And get this. He took our sin in exchange for that and died a penalty we deserved on a cross. Not just a physical death, but paid for all of hell for all eternity. That's how valuable the death of Christ was to God. It would cover our debt to him because of sin. And to prove that he was who he said he was, after he died on that cross, three days later, he rose from the dead. Do you believe that? Have you committed your life to it? Will you commit your life to it? The first rationale for fighting the fleshly lusts, we'll define those in a moment, is we belong to another world. We're we're citizens of heaven. There's a second rationale for fighting against fleshly lusts in this verse. Number two, fleshly lusts provoke the fight. Fleshly lusts provoke the fight. He says, I urge you as aliens and strangers, different, detached from this world, citizens of heaven, to abstain from fleshly lusts. Watch this. These lusts which wage war against the soul. Your lust woke up this morning and picked a fight with you. They're fighting against you. Everything in you, all your visceral urges, all of your desires work against your desire to please God. He says, abstain. Hold oneself back. Self-discipline to to stand. Fleshly lusts. It's a strange, interesting word. Fleshly lusts is not even a a, a bad term in the Greek. It's epithemia. It, It literally means strong desire. The same word is used in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're to have strong desire. We're to have lusting desire after God. A strong, uncontrollable desire for God. But here it's fleshly lust. A strong desire to please the visceral desires of our flesh. 
This verse is really insightful for us as believers if, if we're aware. Just because you're a believer, your fleshly lusts don't go away. Don't you wish they did? That's called heaven, and they'll be gone then. They wage war against the soul. One of my favorite writers, D. Edmund Hebert, says this. These lusts constitute an army of soldiers engaged in constant warfare against your soul. Aimed at capturing the believer and making him useless to God. Again, it doesn't say anything about the devil here. No, the devil's after you. That's for another verse. Your own lusts are after you. Peter mentions the war. Paul explains it. Listen to Galatians 5. The flesh, verse 17, sets the desire, sets its lusts against the Spirit of God. And the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another. So you may not do the things you please. We understand in Romans where Paul says in chapter 7, the thing I want to do, I don't do. In fact, I'm doing the very thing I don't want to do. And he's wrestling. He has this fleshly war going on inside him. And the end of that is, oh, wretched man that I am, who could deliver me? And the next verse, there's no condemnation when you're in Christ. I spent some time this week with two dead friends. They're two of my favorite dead friends, John Owen and J.C. Ryle. I want to tell you, Tuesday and Wednesday, I just took some time away and, um, and read some large sections from both of their writings about sin. And my only response, just as friends, is to tell you that I, after Wednesday, I just wanted to to go away and let you guys have resolved and disappear and just pray. I was so waylaid because in looking for material to try to help you, God held up a mirror and showed me things in my life I didn't even know was there. Very, very painful. This is what John Owen said. There are two things that are suited to humble the souls of men. Very important. Don't miss this. If you're writing things down, listen to Mr. Owen. These are important. Two things that are suited to humble the souls of men. They are, first, a due consideration of God. And second, of themselves. Number one, of God in His greatness, His glory, His holiness, His power, His majesty, His authority. And of ourselves in our mean and lowly, insignificant, abject, sinful condition. Read an article uh, just a few months ago in in a magazine, perhaps you saw it, on what's called the New Calvinism. And it's an interesting article. And uh, what, what, what intrigued me about that article wasn't the article, but the reflection of what's really happening with people who are coming alive to the greatness of God being the author and finisher of salvation. It's a beautiful thing in our generation. We should praise Almighty God that those truths, almost like a new reformation, have come to the surface in our hearing. Let me just tell you as a pastor to a group of college students who meet in the gym every week, as excited as I am about seeing those wonderful awarenesses of the grace of God, of the depravity of man, of, of the system of God picking up people for his own glory. We're, we're praising God. That's wonderful. What I hope will soon follow is a serious fight against worldliness, a hatred of sin. It's almost like we're we, we, we bought this new car and we keep waxing and shining and looking at it and we're not driving it. The whole purpose of Reformed theology is to get us engaged in warring against our own flesh. Elsewhere, Owen says this. Wow. I, I, I just I want to take this as slow as we can. This is where I saw... Man, this is where I was waylaid by Mr. Owen. Labor to know your own frame and temper. Know yourself. Know your disposition. Labor. Work hard to know your own frame and temper. What spirit you are of. And this is it. What 
associates in your heart, Satan has. Wow. Where corruption is strong and grace is weak, what stronghold lust has in your natural constitution and the like. What's, what associates does Satan have in your heart? What a thought. What a thought that in my heart, in my lust, Satan, the enemy of the world, the enemy of my soul, the enemy of God, Satan has friends in my heart that he can call to his own bidding. Those friends are lusts, their desires, their, their impulses that go against the law of God. Those are associates and friends of Satan in your heart. And I'll tell you, I just wanted to reach into my chest and pull out my beating heart when I, when I read it. I don't want associates of Satan in my heart. But they're there. They are there. So let me ask you, are you an expert on your own sin? Now, not the exercise of sin. Are you an expert? Do you know the associates that Satan has in your heart? Can you identify them? Because I promise you, he can. Do you know where you're weak and where you're strong, where the stronghold of lust has a corner in your life. Look, it's pretty easy. There's only three categories. John said all that's in the world, 1 John 2, 14 to 16, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. It's one of those categories or, or a combination of those. Which of those associates is strongest in your heart? Can you identify it? Then my friend, J.C. Ryle said it like this. Unless you really know the character of your own heart, you will never value the gospel as you ought. You will never love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. You will never see how absolutely necessary it was that he should suffer death upon a cross in order to deliver our souls from hell and bring us to God. And then this, Ra concludes, terribly black must be that guilt for which nothing but the blood of the Son of God could make satisfaction. We, we just sang just lofty, lofty words about Christ, about the cross, about heaven. How easy is it Maybe I should can confess. It's easy for me to sing the power of those truths without a clear and deep understanding that Jesus, if you've heard it a thousand times, just hear it for the first time again, that Jesus Christ laid down on, on a crossing piece of wood and where two other criminals were struggling, he, he laid his hands in the perfect place for the, for the soldiers to nail. He put his feet right where they needed to be. He said, Father, forgive them. They, they have no idea what they're doing. He, he, really, he, he really died for those who would believe. Forgive us for being so dull to the gospel, Lord. If you claim to know the Savior this evening and you don't know anything about the battle where you just begin hating what you do, hating how you think, frustrated at how you've acted, disappointed at how you've marred relationships, do you find yourself hating particular sins? Does, does the alarm of your conscience work? Can you hear the Spirit of God using your conscience to say, don't do that, don't say that. Do do that. Do say that. Do you see evidences of the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do you see those as not something you try to do, but that's the fruit that comes out of your love for Christ, wrought by the Spirit. Are you bothered by the fruit of the flesh? Our friend Dr. Piper, who will be here in 
just a couple days, said it like this. So encouraging. If you're fighting sin, you're alive. Take heart. But if sin holds sway unopposed, you are dead no matter how lively this sin makes you feel. Oh, take heart, embattled saint. I love it as a pastor when, uh, when I get college students that come and they say, Rick, I want, I want to talk to you. I'm struggling. I'm, they, they come in and they say, I just, I hate what I'm doing. I'm, I'm frustrated and I, I wish I could stop and I wish I could start and I, I just hate it. Do you think I'm really saved? And I always say this, do, unbelievers don't tend to struggle that way. But here's the great catch. Please listen. Please listen. Here's the great catch. What makes us think that way is Satan has an associate in our heart that makes us doubt the sufficiency of the cross. We, we, we reverse the Reformation. We go back to becoming good Catholics. It's all about the word enough. Well, well I don't pray enough. Well, I don't give enough. Well, I don't read the Bible enough. I don't get up early enough. I haven't done enough. Here's the truth. You'll never do enough. Ever. <laughs> Only he did enough. Thank God for grace. If you studied Romans, and I won't belabor this, but it's just, it's remarkable. Romans chapter 6 basically asks a strange question. He's tooling along in, in, in uh, uh, gospel truth and the, the deep doctrines of justification. And then out of nowhere, he says, what should we say then? If grace abounds, if we have a lot of grace, shouldn't we go ahead and sin so we can have more grace? And then he goes on in 6, 7, and 8. We know those arguments. Here's my question. What made Paul think we were thinking that question? He must have thought, I've, I've spoken so freely about grace that it's nothing you do. That's all the justification of God. I've told you about grace so much that the only conclusion is I don't have to do anything. That's the right conclusion. The application is we get to do this thing called obedience. Listen, you must take sin seriously. The cross shows the gravity and the depth of it. You must believe the worst about yourself. You must be willing to suffer fleshly loss of pleasure and say no to things that bring you temporal pleasure. Just like Moses said no to the passing pleasures of the world, looking to the pleasure of Christ you must be willing to distrust your evaluation of yourself, distrust intuition, distrust instinct, distrust your feelings, distrust your senses. They're all wrong. They're all liars. Paul says these lusts that Peter's talking about, he calls them the lusts of deceit. You know what that means? They're lying to you. They're telling you if you fulfill this lust, you'll be happy. And here's the problem. You are for a moment. doesn't last. Do you kill the sin and slay the sin in battle with your own soul? Again, John Owen, do you mortify? That means do you kill? Do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work to kill those lusts? Be always at it while you live. Cease not a day from this work. And here's the, here's the word. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. It was just a few months ago that my son, John, came in on a morning I was studying in my little... Uh, office at the house, and he, he came and he says, Dad, there's a rattlesnake out by the garbage can. And I said, well, that's great. I mean, sure, whatever. Um, thank you. Um, and he said, no, really, Dad, there's a big one. And I'm like, yeah, we have rattlesnakes all over. He said, well, yeah, okay. And then he opened the door, and I could hear it, and I could tell by the sound, this was not a little guy. And so I went out there in my flip-flops, <laughs> which my wife told me about later, got the shovel, and... Um, dispatched the snake. Um, I don't think he went to heaven. But anyway, I dispatched the snake. Here's what was interesting, though. As, and I don't want to be too graphic. 
But in killing that snake, even with a shovel, um, once the head was severed, the body kept working and the fangs kept pumping venom and kept biting and snapping. Listen to Mr. Owen again. Let no man think to kill sin with a few easy or gentle strokes. He who has once smitten a serpent, if he follow not his blow until it be slain, may repent that he ever began the quarrel. And so he who undertakes to deal with sin and pursues it not constantly to the death. Paul said it very simply. Romans 13, 14. Very important verse, Romans 13, 14. Here's the whole sermon in one verse. Ready? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision or strategy, make no strategy for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Point your life into the position, point your life at the trajectory of pursuing Christ with such vigor that that satisfies you and sin stops. What associates does Satan have in your heart, in your fleshly lusts? This third rationale for fighting, it's a very short one. It's very simple in verse 12. Number three, fruitful evangelism motivates the fight. Fruitful evangelism motivates the fight. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Why would he say that right after this? Fight your own lust so that you can keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Why? So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, because of your life, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. There's a lot of debate about this day of visitation. Let me just say it very simply. Whether it's the coming of Christ in judgment in their lives in this, in this, on this earth, and it could be, or the coming of God in judgment during death, and it could be, or the visitation of the gospel in the life, all of those are true. I happen to think they're probably all in mind here. Your evangelism depends on whether or not you're fighting. Are you fighting? Do the people around you see you as an alien or stranger, or do they see you just like them? Same affection, same life, same movies, same dress, same, same. How's your integrity? Do they see your good deeds? Do they see you fighting? Do they see you pining away, repenting in sin? Have they seen you ask forgiveness when you've offended them? Your evangelism is largely dependent on the people around you seeing that you are serious about your sin. Listen. If you're not serious about your sin, why should they think that your God is serious about sin? In most of the southern countries of Africa, they have national parks. I've been to these national parks. Set up for the conservation of wildlife. They're called wild animal parks. What an oxymoron. But the word park is probably not the best description. They're basically fenced off areas that let nature take its course. The animals are indeed wild there. uh, And if you go there, you need to take great precautions to have game viewing. In August of 2005, a horrible tragedy played out in front of some spectators. A group of tourists and national guards and Zimbabwe saw it happen. A 50-year-old Japanese woman was traveling in that southeastern country of Africa with a group of other Japanese tourists. Saimi Ono was her name, and she did the unthinkable. She left the safety of her safari truck and approached a very lazy-looking pride of lions. She wanted to get a good photograph. All went well, frankly, until she turned to return to the vehicle. At that point, a lioness attacked her from behind 
and in less than 10 seconds had mauled her to death and dismembered her. Ono had severely miscalculated the danger of these beautiful beasts. She was attracted to their beauty in the same way that we're attracted to the pleasure of our sin. And she walked into the deadly danger without precaution. Are you trying to make lions of lust, lions of desire, lions of sin? Are you trying to make them pets? Trying to protect them? Do you orient your life so that you can experience these things? Do you seek the darkness to pursue your lusts? Seek secrecy? The greatest threat to Christianity, the greatest threat to your faith is you. Are you serious? Do you know, have you identified what associates Satan has in your heart? One song I really like says it like this. I'm running from the clothes I'm wearing. He breaks. Listen fresh. He breaks the power of cancel sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean and his blood availed for me. My question to you is simply this. Do you know this great Savior? Have you come to the conference looking for anything but him? Don't go to bed tonight. Don't pillow your head without care for your soul. We want to have a great time this weekend. Please believe me. I, this is my favorite weekend of the year. But it should be the most serious weekend of the year, looking at our sin. Do you know those associates Satan has in your heart? Or are they spies? Are they undetected, unnoticed? Don't go to bed with that relationship unresolved with Christ. There's no doubt that you know someone in this room. If you don't know anyone, then find someone who looks happy. It's likely that they know Christ. Talk to someone about your soul tonight if you're unsure. You say, Rick, that's pretty serious. That's pretty heavy the first night. Are you, are you trying to scare us? Yeah, yeah, a lot, a whole lot. The pleasures of the world will pass. They're like juicy fruit. Tastes great for a little while, and then it's really bad. Are you in the fight? Or do you want to fight? If so, you're fighting yourself. And you cannot do it by yourself. That's why God has given you friends in the church. He's given you pastors and overseers and elders and deacons. Don't hide the associates if you know who they are. Galatians says, confess your sin one to another. Bear one another's burdens. It's a great night to do that. Let me pray.